Welcome to 2023 and the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter. Lesson 5 is titled Dealing with Debt and is read in preparation for teaching on Sabbath, February 4. Sabbath afternoon, January 28. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have the opportunity of not just serving you, but worshipping you. We also have the opportunity of accepting the salvation that's provided because of the death of Jesus, your Son, that each of us could have eternal life. And Lord, as we open your word this week, as we look into it to find what is there for us, for our families, for our church, for our community, and for our own individual lives, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us. And whether we're listening in Bribey Island in Queensland, or Hamilton in New Zealand, or Shanghai in China, or Manila in the Philippines, or Tehran in Iran, or Warsaw in Poland, or Minneapolis in Minnesota, or Nukalofa in Tonga, or Quito in Ecuador, or San Jose in Costa Rica, or in Rwanda and Burundi in Africa, or in the islands of the sea, Lord, wherever we're listening, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be here to guide us, to bless us, and may your love be showered upon us, and may we share that love with those around us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week comes from Proverbs. It's Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 7. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Let's read that again. Proverbs 22 and verse 7. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. One definition of debt is living today on what you expect to earn in the future. Today, debt seems to be a way of life, but it should not be the norm for Christians. The Bible discourages debt. In the Scriptures, there are at least 26 references to debt, and all are negative. The Bible does not say that it is a sin to borrow money, but it does talk about the often bad consequences of doing so. When considering financial obligations, Paul counselled in Romans 13 verses 7 and 8, Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honour to whom honour, Owe no one anything except to love one another. Why is debt an almost international scourge at every level, personal, corporate and government? Every society has always had at least a small percentage who were in debt. But today, a much larger portion of the people are in debt and it's almost never to their benefit. This week, we will consider the reasons for debt and how to deal with it. You may be debt-free, but you can share this valuable information with family and friends who could benefit from it. Sunday, January 29. The Debt Problems. Read Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1, 2, and 12. What is God's ideal for his children regarding debt? How can they attain this ideal? And though this context is very different from ours, what principles can we take away from it to apply to ourselves now? Deuteronomy 28. Beginning at verse 1, Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. And verse 12, The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season, and to Bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. Studies show that there are three primary reasons that people get into financial difficulty. They are listed here in the order of greatest frequency. 
The first is ignorance. Many people, even the educated, are financially illiterate. They were simply never exposed to the biblical or even secular principles of money management. There is hope, however. This lesson will provide a simple outline of these principles and how to apply them. The second reason for financial difficulties is greed or selfishness. In response to advertising and personal desire, people simply live beyond their means. They aren't willing to live in, drive or wear what they can really afford. Many of these same people also feel that they are just too poor to tithe. As a consequence, they live their lives without God's promised wisdom and blessing. Our texts are Malachi 3, verses 10 and 11. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And Matthew 6 verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. There's hope for these people as well, but it requires a change of heart and a spirit of contentment. The third reason people find themselves in financial difficulty is personal misfortune. They may have experienced a serious illness without adequate health insurance. They may have been abandoned by a spendthrift marriage partner. A natural disaster may have wiped out their possessions. Or they may have been born and raised in abject poverty. There is hope for these people too. Though their path is more difficult, their troubles can be overcome. Change may come with the support of Christian friends, the counsel and or assistance of godly counsellors, hard work coupled with a good education, and the blessing and providence of God. Whatever the reason, even if it's a person's own fault, debt can be alleviated. However, those in debt will need to make some changes in their lives, their spending, and their financial priorities. And so to finish today... Read 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 to 9. What is Paul saying here that all of us need to heed? What do these words mean to you? And in what ways can you better follow what the Word is teaching us here? 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning at verse 6. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Monday, January 30, Following Godly Counsel We are material beings and we live in a material world, a world that at times can be very alluring. You'd have to be made of steel and synthetic oil, not flesh and blood, not to feel at times the lure of material possessions and the desire for wealth. At one time or another, who hasn't fantasised about being rich or winning the lottery? Though we all face it, and there is nothing wrong in and of itself in working hard to earn a good living, or even being wealthy, none of us has to succumb to the trap of making idols out of money, wealth and material possessions. We have promised divine power to stay faithful to what we know is right. This is important because the temptation of wealth and material possessions has led to the ruin of many souls. Read Matthew 6.24 and 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Though expressed differently, what's the common theme found in both of these scriptures? Matthew 
24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And we compare that with 1 John 2 verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Unfortunately, the love of the world can be so strong that people will get into debt in order, as they hope, to satisfy that love. It never works. See Ecclesiastes 4 verse 8. There is one alone without companion. He has neither son nor brother, yet there is no end to all his labours, nor is his eye satisfied with riches. But he never asks, For whom do I toil and deprive myself of good? This also is vanity and a grave misfortune. And, because debt is one of Satan's nets that he sets for souls, it just makes sense that God would like to see his children debt-free. He has given us counsel through the Bible and the prophetic gift that will lead us to financial freedom. Read Psalm 50, verses 14 and 15. What attitude should God's people live with? What does it mean to pay your vows, as it says in the New King James Version? Let's read that in Psalm 50, verse 15 and 14. Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. We enter into our church membership with praise and thanksgiving to our God, who has created and redeemed us. In point 9 of 13, in our baptismal vows, we are asked, Do you believe in church organisation? Is it your purpose to worship God and to support the church through your tithes and offerings, and by your personal effort and influence? As Seventh-day Adventists, we all said yes. So this text... Psalm 50 verses 14 and 15 is a promise to those who offer thanksgiving to God and are faithfully paying their vows. And so to finish today, what do your choices tell you about how well you deal with the lure of the world? Why is working hard to earn a good living not necessarily the same thing as making an idol of wealth or money? How can we learn the difference? Tuesday, January 31. How to get out of debt. Read Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. In what sense are we under bondage to the lender? Proverbs 22, verse 7. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. What can be done to escape from this unfortunate phenomenon? If you are in debt... The following outline will help you begin a debt elimination process. The plan is simple. It has a premise and three steps. The premise is a commitment to God to be faithful in returning His holy tithe to access His wisdom and blessing. He is eager to bless those who obey Him. Step one is to declare a moratorium on additional debt. No more credit spending. If you don't borrow money, you can't get into debt. If you don't borrow any more money, you can't get further into debt. Step two is to make a covenant with God that from this point on, as he blesses, you will pay off your debts as quickly as possible. When God blesses you financially, use the money to reduce debt, not to purchase more things. This step is probably the most crucial. When most folks receive unexpected money, they simply spend it. Don't. Instead, apply it to your debt reduction plan. Step three is the hands-on practical part. Make a list of all your debts from the largest to the smallest in descending order. For most families, the home mortgage is at the top of the list and a credit card or personal debt is at the bottom. 
Begin by making at least the minimum payment due on each of your debts on a monthly basis. Next, double up or increase your payments in any way you can on the debt at the bottom of the list. You'll be happily surprised how quickly you can eliminate that smallest debt. Then, use the money that you were paying at the bottom of the debt to add to the basic payment on the next debt as you work your way up the list. As you eliminate your smaller high interest debts, you will free up a surprising amount of money to place on the next higher debts. God clearly doesn't want us in debt. Once the covenant is made, many families find that God blesses them in unexpected ways and the debt is reduced faster than they had anticipated. By following these three simple steps, many families have become debt-free. You can too. By putting God first, you'll receive His wisdom and blessing for managing what He has entrusted to you. And so to finish the day, as it says in Hebrews 13 verse 5, Let your conduct be without covetousness, be content with such things as you have, for He Himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. How could applying these words greatly help people avoid getting into debt? Wednesday, February 1 Surety and get-rich-quick schemes The Bible is very clear that God does not want His children to become responsible for the debt obligations of others. In the book of Proverbs, the Lord has warned us against surety, that is, co-signing or being guarantor for another person. Read Proverbs chapter 6, verses 1 to 5, 17, verse 18, and 22, verse 26. What is the message here? First of all, Proverbs 6, 1 to 5. My son, if you become surety for your friend, if you have shaken hands in pledge for a stranger, you are snared by the words of your mouth. You are taken by the words of your mouth. So do this, my son, and deliver yourself, for you have come into the hand of your friend. Go and humble yourself, plead with your friend, give no sleep to your eyes, nor slumber to your eyelids. Deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, and like a bird from the hand of the fowler. And Proverbs 17 and verse 18, A man devoid of understanding shakes hands in a pledge, and becomes surety for his friend. And Proverb 22, verse 26, Do not be one of those who shakes hands in a pledge, one of those who is surety for debts. Surety usually occurs when a person with poor credit seeks a loan from a lending institution and does not qualify for the loan. The loan officer will tell the unqualified person that if he or she will get a friend with good credit to co-sign with him or her, then the bank will grant the loan and hold the co-signer responsible in the event of a default. Sometimes a fellow church member will come to you and ask you to co-sign. Your response should be, the Bible says I should never do that. Please understand that the Bible encourages us to be helpful to those in need, but we should not become responsible for their debts. Parents are sometimes asked by teenagers to co-sign for the purchase of their first car, or older adult children will ask parents to co-sign for a business loan. The same answer applies. It is appropriate to help others if there is a real need, but do not become surety for the debts of others. Studies show that 75% of those who co-signed end up making the payments. Read Proverbs 28.20, 1 Timothy 6.9 and 10. What's the warning here? Proverbs 28 verse 20, A faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who hastens to be rich will not 
go unpunished. And 1 Timothy 6, 9-10. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Get-rich-quick schemes are another financial trap. They are almost guaranteed to lead to financial ruin for those who get caught up in them. When it sounds too good to be true, it surely is. Many people are hurt emotionally and financially. An additional tragedy with these devious plans is that, in many cases, individuals have had to borrow money to become involved in them in the first place. Many lives and families have been ruined by get-rich-quick schemes that end up enriching only the con artists who devise them at the expense of those who fall into their trap. When a friend or even a loved one tries to pull you into one of these schemes, run. Don't walk. Run as fast as you can. Thursday, February 2. Term limits and borrowing points. Read Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 1 to 5. What did the Lord require of his people as revealed in these verses? Deuteronomy 15, beginning at verse 1. At the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release of debts. And this is the form of the release. Every creditor who has lent anything to his neighbour shall release it. He shall not require it of his neighbour or his brother, because it is called the Lord's release. Of a foreigner you may require it, but you shall give up your claim to what is owed by your brother, except when there may be no poor among you. For the Lord will greatly bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess as an inheritance. Only if you carefully obey the voice of the Lord your God and observe with care all these commandments which I command you today. In harmony with other seven-year statutes of Exodus 21.2 and Leviticus 25.3 and 4, not only were the slaves or servants and the land regulated, but also the lenders. Exodus 21 verse 2 reads, If you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh he shall go out free and pay nothing. And Leviticus 25 verses 3 and 4. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather its fruit. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. Because the lenders did not want to forgive any debts, the longest anyone could be in debt was seven years. Whatever else we can take from these verses, they do show that the Lord cares about these kinds of financial issues, especially when at that time they concerned fellow Israelites. These verses also show that the Lord acknowledged the reality of debt, no matter how bad it generally was. He also emphasised that it was to be avoided as much as possible. Today, by contrast, people in many parts of the world have loans for 30 or 40 years for home purchases. It seems that one reason houses cost so much is that credit is available to provide loans to purchase them. Meanwhile, many people, parents and students, wonder about borrowing money for an education. As a rule, Getting a college degree will enhance a person's income capability for the rest of his or her life. Some people might have to borrow some money to pay for their education, but keep in mind these factors. You have to pay it back with interest. Try to get all of the grants and scholarships that you can qualify for. Work and save all you can for school. Take only courses that will lead to a job. Have parents help. In Bible times, 
parents gave their children farmland so that they could make a living. Today, that inheritance should likely be in education so that they can become independent adults. In an ideal world, there would be no borrowing and no debt. But because we don't live in an ideal world, there might be times when it is necessary to borrow. Just make sure that you have the best deal possible and the best interest rate available. Then, borrow the very minimum that you need and pay it off as quickly as possible to save on interest costs. In principle, however, to whatever degree humanly possible, we should seek to avoid debt, and by following biblical financial principles in our everyday lives, we can go a long way toward avoiding unnecessary debt and the terrible strain it can put on us and our families. And so to finish today, if you have lent people money, how honest and fair and kind are you in your dealings with them? How would you fare before God when you have to answer for those dealings? As we read in Ecclesiastes 12 verse 14, For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Friday, February 3. The three-step process of debt elimination is actually found on one page of Ellen G. White's writings. Emphasis has been added to highlight the points. Be determined never to incur another debt. Deny yourself a thousand things rather than run in debt. This has been the curse of your life, getting into debt. Avoid it as you would the smallpox. Make a solemn covenant with God that by his blessing you will pay your debts and then owe no man anything if you live on porridge and bread. Do not falter, be discouraged or turn back. Deny your taste, deny the indulgence of appetite, save your pence and pay your debts. Work them off as fast as possible. When you can stand forth a free man again, owing no man anything, you will have achieved a great victory. And that's from Councils on Stewardship, page 257. And this is a personal letter written to a literature evangelist or coal porter who was running up major debts with no way to pay for those debts. And Ellen White was giving him specific counsel. Something for us to listen to, I guess. If you need additional help to become debt-free, try these points. Establish a budget. Make a simple budget for keeping a record of all your income and expenses, purchases over a period of three months. Many are surprised to learn how much money they spend on unnecessary items. Destroy credit cards. Credit cards are one of the major causes of family indebtedness. They are so easy to use and so hard to pay off. If you find that you aren't paying off the cards in total each month or that you are using them to purchase items that you would not otherwise have bought, you should destroy your credit cards before they destroy you or your marriage or both. Begin economic measures. Sometimes we aren't aware of how much we could save on our monthly expenses just by being careful about some of the small things that we purchase. They quickly add up. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, the amount of debt that many nations as well as individuals have taken upon themselves is staggering. What has been your own experience with debt and the problems that debt has created for you or others? Two, what could your local church do to help members learn to manage debt or financial issues in general? Three, what are some Bible promises that you can claim to help protect yourself from the lure of the world and the financial dangers greediness can pose to us?
And now it's time for our mission story for this week, read by my niece Sibylla, who, like me, is also a volunteer. Thank you, Sibylla. Trouble Boy to Church Elder by Sharon Milovu Edmund was a troubled child in Mizuzu, Malawi. He refused to obey his parents, teachers or any other adult. At school, he hit the other boys and even the teachers. He gained such a fearful reputation that children and adults alike were scared of him. One day, Edmund decided that it would be fun to disrupt the Pathfinder Club. He took his unruly friends to Chasefu Seventh-day Adventist Church and they mocked the marching and singing Pathfinders. Edmund enjoyed seeing the Pathfinders react, so he and his friends returned week after week. But as the weeks passed, Edmund became interested in Pathfinder activities. He wanted to know more about what the children were doing and what they believed. When the church organised evangelistic meetings at Mizuzu Stadium, he decided to go, but he did not tell his friends for fear that they would laugh at him. He also did not tell his parents, who belonged to another Christian denomination, because he worried that they might punish him. At the meetings, Edmund fell in love with the God of heaven and the Lord of the seventh-day Sabbath. Even though he was afraid that the Adventist children and adults whom he had mistreated so terribly would reject him, he summoned up the courage and gave his heart to Jesus in baptism. His parents found out about the baptism four months later, and they immediately disowned the boy. Edmund stayed in the homes of church members and they taught him more about the Bible until he became well versed in its teachings. He also worked odd jobs to pay required fees so he could stay in school. Three years passed. Edmund's parents saw that he was faithful to God. They saw that he had become a new creature in Christ and they asked him to return home. Today, Edmund Ciceri is married to an Adventist wife and they have two sons. He also serves as an elder at Chasufu Seventh-day Adventist Church, the place where he used to torment the pathfinders. He says that only God could have transformed the troubled schoolboy into a church elder. Never look down on children, no matter how bad behaved they may be, he said. Thank you for your 2021 13th Sabbath offering that is helping to construct a community outreach and leadership development center on the Mizuzu campus of Malawi Adventist University. So more boys and girls, men and women, can learn about the transforming power of Jesus in Edmund's hometown and beyond in the Southern Africa India Ocean Division. This quarter's offering will support six more educational projects in the neighboring East Central Africa Division. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful. And here is a disclaimer. Contents of these lessons are not intended to be financial advice, but is general commentary based on biblical principles. The reader is encouraged to seek competent professional advice which will suit their particular personal situation.